Okay. Perfect. So I hope everybody is here. I, I hope to see a few faces at least. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, for today, we will um, we will deal with uh, function approximation in the context of control. So the, uh, the brief introduction to, to today uh, is as always the lecture will be divided in two parts um, where we will sequentially expand on, on some uh, concept. Uh, the first part will be dedicated to the at, at, at first to the definition of the problem we are going to solve today, which is something a bit more complex or at least a bit more realistic than the usual grid world. We will deal with cut pole. So it's a physical based, uh, physics based uh, problem. And we will try to solve it in different ways. Uh, but um, essentially, um, first in the first part, we will use linear approximation. So we will, uh, we will see what it means and we will see how it applied uh, in a proper, in a concrete way in two ways uh, with state aggregation and with polynomial features. Afterwards, we will uh, do what is beyond linear, uh, linear approximation, in particular non-linear approximation with uh, neural networks, which is essentially what is uh, used in real technological uh, application. And you will, you will see a, a proper example of uh, how it uh, can fail <laughs> when it's used uh, uh, just without using your uh, brain first. Uh, but essentially we will have a, a, just a, a brief description of what it means, how, how it is used, and what kind of libraries uh, are available at the moment for easy uh, implementation. Okay, so first of all, I was saying that we want to um, uh, we want to deal with this cart pole problem. Uh, cart pole is uh, uh, one environment taken from this library, Jim library. You can find it uh, here. Um, it's the description. It's a physical problem in which you have a, a, a pole uh, attached to a, to a moving cart, but yeah, they are it, it's uh, on the track, so it, the cart is moving. You have a, a pendulum. But it's it's a inverted pendulum, so the pendulum starts the um, the pole starts in a vertical position, and you have to try to to balance it, just moving uh, moving it uh, the cart below left and right. Um, so your actions are on the cart, but your reward is that you don't want the pendulum to fail. Um, before we describe it in in with numbers, I just wanted to show you a. A, a movie. This is a very famous problem and all people starting reinforcement learning at some point we will deal with it. So they have also tried to, to solve it in a, in a real context. For example, this uh, user here has showed this brief uh, video in which they applied a similar technique which we will apply, uh, but with a, a real uh, physical uh, problem. And essentially you can see that it's not an easy task and, okay, maybe I should remove the sound, uh, but you can see what, what, what it means is that you have to move down this, this, you have to move the cart below and you have to try to, to keep the pendulum straight. Okay, so clearly uh, it's a fun problem. It's a little less abstract than what we deal, dealt with uh, uh, grid world. Um, but it, in, in, in the, the mathematical implementation, it's very simple anyway. Uh, let me, sorry, let me go here. Um, Code-wise, we, we just have, an, a, an, a, we call uh, this, uh, this library gym, in which there are many of these environments. Um, I'm just uh, importing this cart pole here. You can see the true implementation in the code. You can uh, find it here in this, in, uh, in this um, GitHub repository. But I just want to mention that the basic structure is exactly what I presented in the past lecture. So uh, it's a class of some kind. This is, this is a fake um, skeleton of a class, but you, you always have an, an init 
uh, in which it defined the proper physical world, so it's gravity, uh, length of a pole, uh, uh, dynamics, uh, not dynamics, but parameters of, of uh, dynamics. Then you have reset, as we always seen, it's something which says, okay, start from a scratch. Then we, you, we will have a step function, which you give an action, it, it provides a new state given that action and the current action. Uh, then we will have a render, which unfortunately I will show you, it, it does not work in this, in my computer. Uh, so this is, was just to give an, an image of, of it. Then uh, in particular, this class has a couple of things that I never used, just one, uh, one seed for a random seed um, and something which closed the environment. But I just wanted to show that this uh, cart pole environment here, which comes from a library, which has tens of environment, is of the same structure as we'll always see. So if you have something which works, an algorithm which works with a previous grid world environment or something, it will basically work also with, uh, with this environment here. Okay, um, what is the state space of this environment? Uh, in particular, it's, it's a box for object, but it just means that it's a four dimensional vector of uh, real numbers. Uh, these real numbers are, are um, as such. The first one is the position of the cart, and the second is the velocity of the cart. Okay. The third uh, uh, element is the angle of the pole respect to the vertical, and the fourth is the um, is the pole velocity at the tip. Okay. So basically, the um, this the, the first two are for the cart, the second two are for the are for the um, for the pole. Okay, so this is uh, this is different from what we have seen uh, so far because so far we have always had discrete uh, state space, but this is a continuous state space. So clearly we cannot implement directly what we knew so far. We have to find a, a new way, and we will see that uh, within the constant the context of of uh, linear approximation and uh, nonlinear approximation, we can deal with. That's a problem. The action space is super simple. It's, this is discrete, it's just two. Uh, it's just left and right. So you have, uh, you can act on the cart, you can move it left or you can move it right. And of course you are trying to juggle this, this ball. Um, for this reason, we will, well, perhaps I, I can talk it uh, afterwards. So the state will not be tabular anymore, we will have to deal with that because it's a continuous uh, state, but the action is actually tabular. So we will separate our problem and we will do function approximation only on the states. The rewards, uh, it's very simple. For each time step in which the pole has not fallen, uh, I get one plus one. Um, but the, the, the episode is only 500. So whenever we find a, a reward, of, a, of an episode of 500, it means that we have completely succeeded in not making the pole fall down. And the starting state is always something which is very close to a, 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 a perfectly still position with a steel cart and a vertical pole, but it's not, of course, otherwise it would remain there forever. Okay, uh, the episode termination is if it's the pole angle, it's falling uh, above some, some 12 degrees, of its the position of the cart has fallen off the track. Uh, but this is also important. So more than 500, it's not possible. It, it, it will stop it uh, anyway. It is considered in, in the reinforcement learning tutorial world that you have solved the environment if you manage to have more than 195 steps without making the pole fall over 100 consecutive trials. Okay, so we will see that uh, we will sometimes manage that very good. Sometimes uh, we will not manage to do that. This is how the environment works, but essentially it's, it's, our, it's like our environments worked before. So we have a reset uh, um, function, which to start, then you just give an action, which is going to be or zero or one, left or right. And it gives a new reward, the reward, a uh, new state a reward uh, done, if it's the episode is uh, concluded or not, we'll give it some info, but this we don't care. And um, of course you can, then you can 
you can implement as we did some time ago, like a fixed policy to, to see, but this is not interesting for us. Uh, maybe afterwards we can play with it if we have time, but so right now, no. Um, the point, the only point which I'm sorry for is this uh, usually allows us to see it on uh, in real time with a render, which so like uh, uh, movies like this. This is something which I will show afterwards. It's a very interesting post by Jean Ju, which I will also a link because it, it solves without reinforcement learning. But usually there is a, a movie for each episode, you could, can create a movie, which is something like that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my, I mean, my, my PC with Ubuntu and, and Windows does not manage to, to make it work. Anyway, uh, let's go to that, okay. So let's start. We have our environment. Our environment is this. It's very simple physical based problem of a cart pole. We want to keep it uh, vertical. The state is uh, continuous um, for, uh, for uh, real values. So we cannot apply directly what we had so far. So we have to go in one direction. And we want to go in the direction of value approximation. So far, we had discrete number of states. And we have had a tabular approach. For each state, we could uh, try to evaluate its value, or, or for each pair of state action, we could evaluate the Q value. Clearly, this is crazy in the sense that uh, if the environment is continuous, we would not even know what to do. And if the number of states is very high, this means that you have to. Uh, you have to keep in memory a very large amount of, of, of information. And of course, since you have to visit each state many times to, to have a proper evaluation, you would have to have many, 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 many trajectories. So uh, we need to, to go over that. Um, value approximation is, is a simple recipe, uh, which is very common, I mean, most, most, most common technique um, to do that. Um, basically requires two ingredients or it consists in two ingredients. The first one is that given a, a state S, I need some way to construct an approximate value. So still it needs to do what it has to do. So given a state, I need to have a way to mathematically calculate the, its value. And I need to have a way to update uh, the, this, uh, value, this value given a state given the usual uh, experience. So essentially this, before I had a, a perfect mapping between a state and, and a value, now I have an approximate mapping. Before I had a rigorous way to update uh, the value given uh, our trajectories, now we want to, to create what is a, a, um, the equivalent of that. So in, uh, in value approximation, to calculate the value, we will use an auxiliary weight vectors uh, W such that now the value function is a, is a function of both the state and of this weight view, uh, W. Um, so we will write like this or like that. Um, and essentially this uh, auxiliary vector contains all of our knowledge so far for the value, okay? So at a given time T, I will have, instead of having the values written somewhere, I will have a, a weight vectors uh, written somewhere. And from that, I will be able to calculate the value. And since all information is this in this uh, vector here, uh, also the update will not be on the value itself, but we will, will be in the, on the weights, okay? So every time I have an experience, I will be able to, uh, ex uh, to change my parameters, uh, auxiliary weight vector W, um, so that afterwards the value will change. And as we saw before, the value usually changes with some update like this in temporal difference. So I had some estimator delta, and then I uh, changed my estimation of V and Q. Now I will have uh, my W, my auxiliary vector, and the change is very similar, but instead of changing uh, the value itself, I will change the gradient of the value in respect of the auxiliary uh, vector. So it's an indirect, uh, change instead of changing directly uh, the value, I'm changing 
the value through the, the change of uh, this, um, this uh, auxiliary vector through uh, the gradient of the um, value function respect of the uh, weights. Okay, so this is extremely general, which means that we are not dealing with the value anymore directly in a tabular sense, but we are dealing with some weights, which for now do not mean anything. We will see that there are, uh, um, in the linear approximation, the weight will have a very simple meaning. So in linear approximation, first of all, we have to, um, instead of using the state S, we will use um, we will write this state in a sense in a, in a basis which are of features and the features uh, are different uh, um, have different let's say in a sense different property of the of the state and the, the features will be we live in a different uh, space with dimension d um, and will be real numbers of dimension d so it's just a, a so with, for each state, I will have the d value, d real values, which will correspond to the features of the uh, to the features component of that state. This seems complex, but for a, it can be understood in a very simple reason. For example, the state could be a house. And the features could be the number of of baths, and the number of rooms. Okay, so the house is a very complex uh, thing which contains a lot of information. The features will be how many baths is there, how many rooms are there. And of course, for each house, you will have a small numbers, which is, for example, uh, a house could have three rooms and one bath. So three and one will be the feature vector of the features, which are how many rooms, how many baths of that house. So it's a, it's a way to connect the state to a vector of real valued numbers. Uh, the good thing is that normally the dimension of the features, uh, is, which is called D, can be extremely smaller than the uh, dimension of the, of the space. If uh, the dimension of the space is all houses in Trieste, then we gonna be uh, thousands and thousands. Uh, but if the features are only the number of baths and the number of rooms, then it's, this dimension is only two. Uh, the features are an extremely important uh, part of the of the game, and clearly, uh, they they are a double-edged sword. So if you choose the features very well, then everything is simple. If you choose the features very poorly, then everything is almost impossible. But once you have the features, which is an extremely important part of of of, of machine learning, reinforcement learning, but once you have the features. Linear approximation says that then the value can be uh, approximated or is approximated by just a sum of some weights multiplied by the feature. So it's a linear um, combination. It's a linear several, um, uh, It's a linear function of this feature here. Okay. So this is linear approximation. You have your state, which is described by some some features. And then you just multiply those uh, feature vector by some numbers and you have the value. Uh, generally speaking, this can be done for uh, both the state and the action. We will, as I said, since the state is complex because the state is continuous uh, uh, positions, uh, angles and et cetera, et cetera, but the action is just left and right. What we are going to do is that we are going to do lin a linear approximation in the states. So the states will have corresponding features which we'll use to calculate the value approximation, but the action will be just two different set of states. So when I want to calculate the value for a state and an action, I will take the feature vector of that state and I will multiply by a set of, of uh, weights which correspond to only that action. So I will need to store two different uh, uh, weights for the action. So this is a simple way of uh, dealing with it. Okay. To recap, the basic idea of linear approximation is that uh, I have a state, I, cons I, I choose some features, and then the state has a, a feature vectors in these features, for example, number of beds, number of rooms, and et cetera, et cetera. 
and the value is a linear combination of this uh, feature vector x of s. Second thing we will we'll discuss briefly is that to choose the feature is extremely relevant to how well the reinforcement learning will uh, perform. Good. If you have a question so far. Okay, then we will deal with the most simple uh, linear approximation, which uh, conceptually at least, which is state aggregation. State aggregation, it means essentially that if the state space is for example, like this, it's continuous or it's too detailed or everything, then instead of dealing with state, we're dealing with regions of state as our unit uh, elements. And so the, to, we have the features which are regions of, of the state space and the feature vectors will be just a, a series of zero, except for a one, and then one correspond exactly to that region in which the state is. Okay, uh, so we have divided the space, we have a single state, and then the question is, where is that state in the region three? Okay, then you have a vector in which everything is zero except for the position three in which I have a one, which says I am in that region. Then the implementation of the algorithm is extremely simple. Um, Essentially, it's the same. For example, this is uh, this is using Sarsa. It's the same thing. It, you have a state, then the state is it's mapped in it's a, a feature vector. So essentially, you have to find in which region it is. You calculate the value using the approximation, the linear approximation. Then you use this linear approximation of the value to select an action. You use an action which brings the state into a new state and gets the reward. Then you have the new state. In the new state, you can see in which region it is, and from which which the reason the region in which it has fallen afterwards, you can get an approximate estimate of the value function. Okay, essentially, you have you still work in states, but uh, but the states are mapped into regions, and you only have values for those regions and not uh, for the states anymore. Why is it extremely uh, simple? Because as you remember, we need the gradient of the value function with respect of V and we can check very simply. So if the value uh, for a state and an action e with a, a, with a auxiliary vector W is just the sum of these weights multiplied by the feature vector, if the feature vector is just everywhere zero except for a one, and that one is the one corresponding to the region in which our state it is, then the value function is actually not, not, none other than the single entry of a weight vector corresponding to that region. Okay, so formally we have that the value function is a linear combination of the weights and the, and the state, the feature vector. But actually it's just that it, it reduces to just one W. When you do a gradient of just, you do a gradient, so a derivative for uh, W1, W2, W3, and you have only just Wj, it means that the gradient is actually a series of zero with just one. Okay. So formally, it seems very complex. In reality, it's basically that instead of working with SARSA in the single state, you work in SARSA in these regions of state. Okay, so state aggregation means you're, you're making a coarse grained uh, state space of regions and you work there, essentially. Uh, one of the simplest way, then, then you, have, you have to construct the regions and you have to construct the way to uh, implement uh, the state into a map of the state into a region. One, one, uh, one simple way is binnings. We all know how binnings work. For example, if I have two dimensions, S1 and S2, uh, then we can have some divisions uh, along the two directions. For example, we have three states here, uh, red, um, orange, and green. And you can see that there are three different states, but actually, they, they are only in two different uh, regions. So this red and orange will share the same weights. Okay. Uh, clearly you can do it many ways. Uh, for example, you can decide that one dimension is irrelevant. So essentially you aggregate all states in that, in that, in that dimension. For example, uh, 
uh, I'm considering S1 is important. So I want to keep S1 different uh, from one state to another. But I, I said that S2 is actually completely unimportant. Uh, so two states can be very close in, in, a, in a metric sense of S1 and S2, but, or very far, but actually they can be aggregated in a completely different way uh, uh, if my state aggregation is different. Okay, as I said, uh, formally, we have that the vector uh, of features is a long series for zero with just one. Uh, in this particular sense, maybe, for example, here it would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 except for here. Uh, it's, it's a 1D vector of features. Sometimes it's easier to, to construct it as a matrix, but it, it is 1D vector of just features which, with 0 and 1s. And the uh, weight vectors at the same dimension, so it's, it's again, it's a 1D vector uh, with auxiliary weights which contains the current estimation of the values, okay? Uh, so one, formally you are doing a linear multiplication element-wise between the two. And so you are doing a lot of zeros plus one value, but clearly in the practical implementation, generally you just have uh, some vector of weights and you choose the index, which is relevant to the region you are considering, okay? so. Formally, you are doing uh, a lot of zeros and a lot of multiplication with zero, but practically you do state aggregation and you deal with regions instead of all things. In a sense, we could do uh, state aggregation without changing what uh, the algorithm we had last time. If you do state aggregation outside of the, of the reinforcement learning, if you have your uh, for example, you have your, uh, in your ep episode, you get the new state. And instead of giving to this state to the reinforcement algorithm and reinforcement uh, learning algorithm, you give the, the region, then the reinforcement learning should not even be changed. It can work anywhere, anyway, okay? I wanted to present a, a proper implementation of it which is a bit useless, but maybe it's a bit, uh, it shows more clearly what is happening. So uh, we create a new version of Sarsa in which we are dealing the things properly. So we have to store the weights instead of a Q value, but the weights are the Q value in a sense. Uh, we need a way to perform the state aggregation. So we need a function which takes the state and reproduce a vector of, uh, of features. And we need a, a way to compute Q with linear approximation. So doing the proper multiplication of the feature vector with the features of weight. Okay, so I, I will add it inside the class, but I just wanted to, to, to share it because this is one, one new thing. This is something which is just a state aggregation function. It takes a state, it takes uh, the, the way the state is, uh, should be binned. So binning is just the, uh, it's, a, it's an array. I can show it uh, here, for example, one. Okay. Uh, for example, it's an array of, of four and, and you have the lower, uh, lower bound and the upper bound of, of each dimension. Okay. This is binning, it's just the, the bounds of each dimension. And N binnings, where it is, sorry, I apologize for this. N binning is just the number of, of, of regions in which each dimension should be uh, divided to. Okay. Uh, then I have to create a um, vector of feature which is zero everywhere. And I have a vector of indexes which is zero everywhere. Okay. To, to keep track of where the single one will go. Then I take the state, I take each of the four dimension, which are real number of the state. And I just do the binning. If a state is below a lower bound, I put it in the first uh, box. If it's above the upper bound, I put it in the last box. And if it's in, in, in somewhere in, in between, I just do the normal binning thing. I take the state, I shift it by the lower bound, I divide it by the by total dimension of the bounds, and I, I take, uh, which, which uh, index it is. At the end, I have a vector space which was 
everywhere at zero, but now I have at the single place, I have a one. Okay, this is a very complex thing to get a single one <laughs> from the beginning. Does it work? So now, okay. Now I have uh, my state. I'm, I'm the environment is cart pole, so this just returns the starting state. I'm printing, so this is the state. So it's four real numbers very close to zero. Uh, and then if I ask the state aggregation uh, in these simple rules, for example, I'm asking a binning which is actually asymmetrical. Let's let's just let's do three 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 or something. Then. I can, I can, okay, I can ask, okay, if uh, the binning is three in each dimension, we, what is my index? My index is one, 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 zero, one. So my, the, prop, the proper X is, L, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matrix of everywhere zero except for a one. Uh, properly, in the real sense, the feature vector is a series of zeros with just one. Okay, the fact is the matrix it's for practical use, but formally this is the feature vector of the state S. Good. So I hope I have not lost you so far. So essentially the SARSA for state aggregation is a very simple modification of SARSA, which requires only the binning. So it's the same. So instead of gamma, you have get gamma. Instead of space size, now I call it feature size. Uh, now I have some information to do with the proper binning. Uh, and now instead of having the storing the tabular uh, value, Q value, I'm storing the tabular weights. So I, I used to have self Q values equal to n to zero of the state space action size. Now I have this um, weight, uh, weight vector with I'm saying. Then I have the function state aggregate, which is the same as I showed before, which takes a state and returns a proper feature vector of all zeros except for one and the indexes where the one is. And then the single step update is actually super simple. So I get, it's a SARSA. So you have S, A, R, new S, new A state action reward new state new action uh, but i'm not working the state anymore so instead of the state i'm asking for the bind so the feature vector x and actually the index the index is where the one is and instead of working with the new state i'm working with the new feature vectors so where at the beginning i had the delta q was the reward minus the value Formally, I should do that the delta Q is the reward minus the pro dot product of all the vectors X and all the vectors Y, element Y, um, W, element Y, which in, in Python it's this strange thing, tensor dot, it means that it sums over all the axes. Instead of doing that, I just do the delta Q equal to R plus zero minus the weight at the position of x index. And you can see that actually this formulation here and this formulation here are essentially the same, but I'm not working in the, in the space of, of s, I'm working in x. If the episode is not done, then you have the basic thing you used to have uh, r plus cell gamma q values in the new state, new action. Now I have r plus cell gamma uh, w new x new action minus uh, w in x in action and you used to have uh, minus q values of s and a okay so same thing as before but instead of working in s i work in this state aggregated space and then the update is essentially the same it used to be that q values plus uh, le le learning rate multiplied by delta q now is formally again it's a multiplication of uh, the learning rate, the delta, and the uh, vector of features, which are everywhere zero except for a one. So in a practical sense, it's just an update of a single entry of this uh, v, uh, uh, vector, which is just like that, okay? It's basically the same. 
how to get uh, epsilon greedy. Again, we are not working anymore with Q values in a tabular sense. So I have first to get the aggregate state, but then I can easily calculate the Q value approximate. Okay, but one where this was the Q value for a single state in a tabular sense, now this is the Q value approximate for all the state which have the same uh, feature vector uh, X. Greedy policy is the same. So. Sarsa in the most basic sense. Now, uh, before we had no uh, nothing, nothing we could we could choose. Uh, whoops, let's do one thousand. So now we are doing a, a binning, which is a bit. Uh, I let's say I have no idea what my system should do. So I'm starting with a binning of uh, which is uniform. Let's do it. Uh, perhaps it's. Uh, even numbers are, are simple. So I have four dimension, I have to decide. Uh, so these were unbounded, most of them, but I want to keep it uh, restricted to the small region. Um, so let's do minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Uh, I have four dimensions, so I, I want to have some uh, choices, but not too much. So I will have four, 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 four. And you can see that if you have many dimensions already, this number is incredibly large. So 4444, four, 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 it seems very poor disc, uh, discretized version of the state space, but it's, it's a reason of a, it's quite a lot of um, numbers. Okay, and then it's always the same. I'm initializing my, my algorithm. I'm keeping track of the performance. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm doing convergent, uh, um, like a decaying uh, learning rate and epsilon. Uh, and this is exactly the same as we have always seen, okay? So, uh, clearly I say, uh, this is, sorry, uh, print E and uh, apologize. Yes, yes, I understand because this does not exist anymore. Okay, you can see it's quite fast. I asked for a thousand uh, episodes. So uh, you, we have time for a question if you have one. And as always, I'm trying to be as modular as possible in the, in the um, reinforcement uh, methods and the environment. This means that everything is extremely slow. So if you are trying to do a technological implementation, I advise to change basically anything. Uh, and we will see afterwards with neural networks, it will be like the worst use of neural network you will see around for years. But it's just for um, teaching. Okay, very good. So you will see what happens. Uh, actually, it takes 1,000 uh, 1, um, episodes, but it reasonably well uh, understand and, and finds the correct solution means that at the beginning, we had very uh, noisy. Remember that this is the, each of these numbers is the number of steps in which the pole did not fall. So at the beginning with less than 100, it was doing random things and it fall, was falling off. And remember that the definition of solution is that for 100 consecutive episodes should be above 195. So perhaps we managed to do that, perhaps not, but still, it, it's quite clearly uh, quite clear that he managed to find a rather good uh, way to solve the um, solution so far. And um, so we, we did a rather coarse uh, binning and, and it worked. Okay. Of course, one say, okay, uh, this does not solve it perfectly because the binning was too small. So let's try to go uh, higher. Okay, um, and we will see that actually, most probably the result will be uh, not what we expect. So, I, in, if I have a, a higher binning, it means that the the system is seen more detailed. Okay, so it can differentiate better states in which should do one action instead of another. But it also means that the number of parameters in which it should which should learn it's much higher. For example, if I, I went for four to five, uh, to four to eight, so twice, but I had four dimensions. So I had twice, 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 okay? 
And it actually, even if the description of the state is better, so it's more detailed, it can resolve the, the system better, actually the performance is much worse. It almost never reaches 500 and it for sure has not 100 consecutive um, episodes above 195. So a very nice thing which I found in this, uh, in this um, uh, blog, which I, I showed be before and I will show again, um, is that if you take this, so for example, let, let's do a bit of physics. So we have a cart moving with, with a pole and uh, we want to balance the pole. So first of all, do you think that the position of the cart is relevant? Perhaps no. Okay. And then if you have some small, uh, small uh, physical uh, idea, it actually the idea is that, for example, if, if the pole is falling uh, somewhere, then perhaps you should also move it there to, to balance it out. But also that if the, if the pole is, is moving, maybe, maybe it's, it's the, the orientation of the pole, it's, it's, uh, it's, it looks like it's falling, but I have a velocity and I know that it's moving like that, then perhaps I have, need to stabilize in the other direction. So with very few physical consideration, we, we arrive to this super strange, uh, super strange beaming here. Uh, so the beginning now is super coarse. It's just, I don't care about the position of the cart. I don't care about the velocity of the cart. And I, I strangely care about the other two dimension. And we will see if I'm not completely wrong. And I hope I'm not. So I'm using even less episodes. So I'm maybe wrong completely. Okay, less episodes is, is not sufficient. So let's go back to... I apologize. And I, I hope it works. <laughs> Otherwise, I would make a fool of myself. Please, 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 please. So now the. Yeah. Okay. It has not. You can see that something strange is happening. So um, actually, he has found a lot many times a perfect state, but if the, the system has not converged. Any... Ah, okay. Uh, okay, I will answer the chat. Uh, please, when you make a, a question on the chat, please uh, um, tell me before because I, I'm not always seeing it. So I will go back to it. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will make, I will put 2000 episodes and then I will talk about the two questions. The first question was, uh, what is the feature for the card for problem? Okay. Uh, so the, the um, now the card pole problem, the state has four real numbers. So the state is, uh, it's given like here, the state is composed of a position of the cart velocity, of the pole angle and the pole velocity as it's t. Okay, this is the state. The features is what I want to consider. In, in the case of state aggregation, the features are the regions which I'm considering as a group. For example, if I do this uh, some binning, okay, let's let's consider. Uh, um, let's consider only in one dimension. I have one dimension. I have a continuous from zero to one. I have four beams. The features are: Am I in the uh, first quarter of the of the beam? Yes. That is my feature. Okay, the feature is, am I there? Okay. So in state aggregation, the features are, do I belong to this region of state space? So the state are four real numbers and the features are the discrete, the, the belonging to a region in this fourth dimension of space. Okay. Um, then the sec I hope this answered the question. Otherwise, maybe we can talk a bit in, in the in the post. Okay, perfect. With two thousand, we, we see that it has perfectly learned uh, the solution. Okay, I just wanted to show. 
why is the reason of this being, uh, I changed the, the bound here. So it turns out, and this is shown in this uh, very nice, uh, you can find in, uh, in, I will send the link, this uh, how to beat the card for game in five lines by Jan Ju, uh, um, that actually the solution from a physical point of, of sense is just that you, you want, when the angle is small in amplitude, you want to stabilize the angle. So you want to, to try to make the angle as, most, as small as possible. But when the angle is large, no, so, sorry. When the angle is small, you want to go uh, opposite to the, uh, to the angular velocities. But when the angle is, is large, you want just to try to, to put it as close to zero as possible, okay? So since we only care when the angle is small, I actually created this binning here. So three binnings, it means that there are three bins. One binning is from minus infinity to minus 0 0.03. The second binning is from minus 0 0.03 to 0 0.03. The third bin is from 0 0.03 to infinity. Okay, so this, I change this bin because I only care, there are actually only two situations I care. Am I, is my feature to be inside of this small angle range? Yes, no, or no, okay? Since my policy is depend, the, the policy which is from a physical sense. So this is not a reinforcement learning policy. This is a policy created by ad hoc. If this policy, uh, if, I, if I'm able to, dis, uh, to distinguish these two positions, then it's enough. And why I did a two binning there? Because this is the velocity or the velocity of a peak. And I just need to know if it's, if it's negative or positive. So this strange binning here, actually is able in a minimal sense to see if the angle is very close to zero from this binning here, and if the pole velocity at the tip is negative or positive. And this is sufficient information from the four dimensional real numbers, which I had as a state, to create a perfect, uh, a perfect policy, okay? Why is it nice this? Because it, it means that the problem is actually very simple, but you have to solve it beforehand to actually use the proper state aggregation, which makes it very simple to solve even in reinforcement learning sense. So the message here is that the first thing I could do is just, okay, the lower bound, I will take the lower bound since the cart could go everywhere in the world. So the lower band is minus 2000, the upper band is minus 2000. I want a very de detailed uh, scale. So I will put that the first dimension is 500 beams, okay? What I, this is like the brute force approach. I want to create a state aggregation, which is as detailed as possible. This will never work. If you have a physical intu intuition, which you can put into your state aggregation, it will work much better than if you put as, uh, as much detail as you can. Okay, um, good. Are there questions so far? Otherwise I, mm, I can go fast into linear, uh, maybe not too fast in the polynomial um, feature. May I add a yes. comment uh, on this? Because this is very uh, useful as an example. It's also very important. So uh, it's, it's important to compare different uh, uh, philosophical approaches to, to the problem of function approximation. Uh, so linear approximation is good because it's uh, explainable, it's transparent, okay? When you construct such an approximation, you get what you put in, especially if you select manually your features, okay? And of course, the operation of selecting manually your features must be guided by some expert advice. So this is the point where uh, reinforcement learning makes connection to a branch of machine learning, which is now not very popular, but was extremely popular in the 80s, uh, which is expert advice. So to construct databases uh, or collect data of experts, which can make suggestions about the way you should make decisions. Uh, so this is a, a great example of expert advice in the sense that 
Uh, uh, Emanuele has been looking for expert advice. Uh, uh, he found these nice suggestions and he chose uh, the features suitably and was able to reduce your infinite state space, okay, a four dimensional uh, continuous space into a handful of features and to solve exactly the problem. A brute force approach, like uh, uh, I just said, in which you try to discretize would have failed miserably. And you can check it, it does fail, right? As, it, as you have, have seen. Uh, a machine learning approach in which you try to automatically find the features might or might not work, okay? So you might ask the question, can I learn this representation? Can I learn these features? So there are techniques which address this problem but they depend on the data set on, on which you perform your training. So for instance, if you produce data with a policy which is bad and the poll always falls, you never realize that this is a good set of features, okay? So also automatic construction, constructing your features might fail if the way you collect the data is not informed itself. So you might think that there is less expert advice, but there's always a little bit of expert advice. So this comment is important because I think uh, it's a sort of a, an existential comment for uh, those of you, uh, especially for those of you who come from uh, uh, other backgrounds than pure computer science. Uh, there is a meaning to be a scientist, okay? So there's a meaning to add knowledge into machine learning and not to just to think of taking a completely blind black box approach. Okay. There is value into this. There is opportunity of solving extremely difficult problems if you put knowledgeable input into your, into your problems. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so perhaps we we better have a small break now, um, and then restart in in fifteen minutes. Um, so. If you have questions, or okay, I will pause the, um, the recording. Okay, let's let's start uh, again with the second part. Um, so first of all, we are going to do with uh, deal with polynomial features. So so far we have seen the feature which are where state aggregation. So whole parts of the state space were condensed into a single entity, a single region. Uh, now we're going to deal with something different, which is um, how to construct polynomial features. So uh, in this particular case, it was it, it's simple because we have a state which is already done by um, a vector of real numbers. So we could construct um, some features which are just a polynomial expansion of, of this um, of these uh, numbers, uh, of these, um, I think these real numbers which con constitute the state. So, uh, for example, we could have uh, we could have some matrix uh, multiplication, and then we have that uh, x is a vector uh, made by a linear combination, then quadratic combinations of of these uh, components of the state. In particular case, we're doing a very special one, which is a polynomial only name because it's going to be linear in the sense that we are taking the feature of the state exactly as the values, the coordinate in real, uh, real values of the state. So essentially our new uh, feature vector will be identical to the state, okay? Uh, but we could have taken, for example, we could have expanded instead of only having the four real numbers, we could have the for real numbers and then all the pairwise combination, for example, S1 multiplied by S2, S1 multiplied by S3, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, we take the simplest one, which is that the features are the state itself. Um, then, uh, I, let's recall that the features are the position, the cart velocity, the pole angle, and the pole uh, velocity. Okay, so the first two to the cart and the second to the, to the pole orientation. Um, then the value, the approximation of the value is a linear approximation of these features. In particular, I will have to store 
uh, a vector w, which is only four real numbers, and the value approximation is going to be only that uh, the, the inner pro the, the dot product between the weights and these four real numbers. Okay, so the whole method is that I took a polynomial um, features, uh, but right right now it actually took exactly a linear combination, actually the identity over the state. And I'm going to multiply by four values. And for each state, I will just determine the value as this linear combination here. This is extremely limiting. And we will see that since the problem itself, it's the dynamics are not linear, then this is a very stupid idea and it will fail. But it, just to, to point out that this is a way to do. Um, once the feature calculation is done, the control algorithm is exactly the same as before. So I will very rapidly go over to it. So we, we, have, to con we have to save this weight uh, W, uh, U, which are actually only four values for the action left and four values for action right. Then the polynomial features of the state is just the state, okay? And I'm leaving here for exercise. Uh, if you want, I also al almost put everything you need to do, at least something which is slightly better than this, which is going to a full second order polynomial features, okay? So you see here, I commented it, but you can construct a, a feature vector, which instead of having only S0, S1, S2, S3, as also a zero order and all combination of second order. Okay, in principle, you could add all combination of third order. Okay, I'm going to deal right now with solution uh, only using the first order of the polynomial feature. But this is before I add state aggregation here of only polynomial features, but again, I only produce uh, X. Then the single step update now is done with the um, with only this this very very simple thing here, which is the equivalent of the formal uh, definition. So the Q value approximate is the dot product between the vector of the weights and the feature vector. Uh, like the the Q values in the new state and the new action is the dot product between the values the weights in the new state and the new uh, feature vector. But everything is the same as before. And then I, right now, it's not a single update, but I'm updating all the matrix of the weight vector with this. Okay, depending on the feature vector, I'm updating uh, the weights, okay? The definition of getting action epsilon grid is the same because again, what I need to do is just select the feature vectors and then construct the approximation of the value and then everything else. So it's essentially exactly the same method as before because it is the same, exactly the same method. So linear approximation, but now I change the feature, the feature vector. So this means that whatever strange feature you, you can cook up, if you have a, a, if you add a function which takes the state and returns the feature vector, this works because this is by definition the linear approximation. How you construct the feature vector is something else. Uh, I just wanted to show that uh, now I already run it. So to make it fast, uh, I'm using the same, same parameters as before, the same uh, um, number of episodes, the same um, environment, the same everything. I did 2000 episodes just in, the, in this short time of a break. And this is the result. The result are consistently around 40. And 40 is by definition what you, uh, what you get with the random policy. So if you take a drunk person and you, you, try, you say, please try to keep this inverted pendulum uh, vertical, basically it works as a linear approximation with polynomial feature of first order, okay? Again, why? Because the, the first order polynomial feature, it's a, it's a poor way to construct features, um, which is, is good in the sense that we, again, this is a 
if you want to, to construct the feature in an intelligent way without resorting to machine learning, this is a, one idea is that if your problem is non-linear, then you should have features which include this non-linearity. Okay, but this is, was just to show that the linear approximation method is uh, it's very general and it's uh, separated from the uh, way you construct features. So you construct features and when you have that, linear approximation just means that the value approximation is a, it's a linear combination of those features with some weights and you have to up update the weights and not uh, anymore the, the Q value. Good, let's go beyond linear approximation. So this is what it's done normally. And it's something which has achieved an incredible success, especially in the last few years. Uh, when you, especially now, the new iteration, the new results are such that you do not, everything is it's done in with machine learning in the sense that there is no this expert uh, advice. There is a, the new iteration of, uh, um, AlphaGo and, and everything actually do not require any uh, expert advice and they con uh, consistently are performing the best. Uh, we will show that if you are not able to reach that technological sophistication, it will not work without an expert advice. But the idea is that we are going in that direction. We are going in the direction of neural networks. So, Linear approximation was that once you had the features, you had only one way to construct the approximation of the Q of the value, which was a linear combination. Now you can use whatever you want and will have to be a parameterized function with some weights, which parameterize the function to be the best description of possible of the value. We use neural network because neural network has been proven um, theoretically, but also in a practical sense to be very well behaved universal function approximators. They can, in theory and in practice they do, reproduce uh, any given functions uh, with some, uh, with, with, uh, some um, parameters inside which have a space which can be very large. But still, they are in a sort of some fitting function uh, with the with weights as parameters. Uh, they have many, many, many different types, but essentially they, they share most uh, often some uh, uh, particular architecture type. And also uh, one of the most important features that they have, they have to have some uh, the degree of non-linearity in, in, in them. Okay, uh, why do I call them fitting function? Because essentially uh, what you want to do is minimize the value error, as you know from theory, uh, which is for example, the expected value if you follow a policy of the value of the policy um, you are currently uh, estimating minus what, minus what, you, what you are using as, as an as a, as a, uh, experimental value. Uh, so this could be the return or whatever minus the, uh, your current estimated uh, value, depending on the weights. Okay, so this is a function, this is like a, a, a target value, and you want to minimize uh, the distance between what, you, what the output of the function is and what you want to get, your target. Uh, so it's basically a fitting uh, problem. How do neural networks work? So I just want to go in the, shortest possible uh, through the basics. Uh, generally speaking, they have a structure which is uh, rather linear in the sense that uh, you, perhaps linear is not the good word, it's, uh, it's a directional. You start from a vector of input X, you go through uh, internal, no, internal what are called layers of uh, so consequential um, uh, groups of operations, and then you end up at the end with uh, an output, which is your evaluated uh, function uh, output, and then you have to compare it to a target result. Uh, usually speaking, uh, the, the first and perhaps most uh, common to start is the dense layer, in, which means that um, so each each of these edge you see. Uh, correspond to a weight parameter. So it's, it's a real number. 
and each of the nodes correspond to an operation. In this case, it's a simple operation uh, which connects, uh, for example, you, take, you can see H2 uh, or, uh, or this node here takes uh, a linear combination with these parameters of the input, like some, something like that. And then, so this is a linear operation, so a linear combination of all the weights, uh, which are the parameters which will change of the neural network. And then at the end, it will do, generally speaking, a, a filter, a nonlinear filter. Um, so, for example, H11, what, what will happen? It will happen that it will have uh, some sum over all the input multiplied by uh, all the weights plus some uh, other parameters which are acting as a bias. It will get a number. And then after this number is taken in a linear way, it will act, act uh, with a, a nonlinear function. These are two very fam famous ones. The uh, one uh, above um, is, a, is a sigmoid. Uh, so it essentially, it's, it takes whatever it has before and it returns something, a new number, which is uh, it, it's, um, uh, between zero and one. Okay, like an acti activation function. And this clearly breaks all the linearity which was before. Uh, or an, a, a very common one which is used now is called ReLU, um, which is a nonlinear function which returns zero if the number be, uh, which has get, uh, got as an input was minus, uh, less than zero, and the number itself if it is uh, above zero. So it, this is a zero everywhere, except if it was a positive number, then it returns the positive number. So each node takes the information of the previous node with some weight with some parameters of the neural network, computes it, and then use the nonlinear filters, and then pass it on. Okay, so this is the reason why you have these layers. Each layer works only on the previous layer computes each node computes a number and pass it on to the next layer which computes each node computes an operation of the of, of the previous layer and so on and so forth until you have reached the end uh, so a neural network is a collection of uh, it gets to millions of weights of different values uh, w uh, and inside it can have thousands and thousands of individual operations of this uh, big um, with sums, then this nonlinear uh, filtering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it turns out it is very convenient to use, and there are two. Um, there are essentially two reasons why it, it's that. It's because even if it seems crazy that it's not difficult to get the gradient of this function here with respect to the parameter, it is actually a rather straightforward thing, because we can use the chain rule of this differentiation. So since each of these operations happen sequentially, you can actually go through the gradient of, from, the, from the last part and separate each individual part. So all nodes not only have, uh, can use co to construct the function as it goes on, but also can construct its gradient depending only on the on the on the layer um, on the closest layer. Okay, so with using the chain rule and the back propagation, actually it's very simple to construct the uh, the way to update all the weights. What it means? Okay, so the neural network produces some some values which are our prediction of the value. Then we have the target. Okay, these two numbers will not be the same. So uh, we will define um, a loss. So a distance between what I have predicted and what I actually wanted to, to, to come out from the neural network. And then I, have, I can, since this is a, a sequential part of nodes connected one with the other, I can easily construct the derivative of, of, of the gradient of this uh, loss respect to the first layer and then the derivative of what I got in the first layer depending on the second layer, and then the derivative of what I got in the second layer depending on the third layer, and so on, so on, so on, so forth. And then I can construct the update for each individual parameters just as a combination of the, all these small tokens of, of, of gradient which I constructed before. Okay, so it's rather simple because I, 
even if it seems like a massively uh, complex object of operation one inside the other, actually I can use the, the fact that it, the gradient is very simple to calculate from one layer to another to say, okay, I got this number. I want to be this number to close to that number there. And then I can change and my local my gradient propagates uh, backwards into the neural network. Okay. All of this to say that this simple fact that it's, it has a simple structure and then uh, all the nodes act only on, on closed, closed nodes and, and um, uh, in a very closed and, and like um, separate way. So it's, 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 it's uh, blocks of operation. It makes so that it's easier actually uh, some, uh, some straightforward, if not easy to construct the gradient and so to construct the update. With it. Okay, um, how do we use it? Uh, generally speaking, uh, nobody writes uh, neural networks anymore from scratch because there are wonderful tools online. Um, I will use uh, this uh, library Keras, which is rather common. Um, it's, it's written to be very simple to visualize and, and use. Uh, in particular, I will construct uh, what is called a sequential uh, model, which is basically something like that. So I, I will have just a, a, a straight um, sequential um, structure of layers. And uh, this is all that it is to, to write, to define a, a neural network. So I, I say I want this neural network to be a sequential model. I want to add a first layer uh, of uh, 20, given that the input dimension will be four, which means I'm taking an input of four and I want to construct a layer of 20 nodes. And these 20 nodes each uh, interact with this ReLU, which means that uh, all of these nodes will, uh, will be connected with weights to the first, to the input uh, numbers will combine a linear function of these weights and, and the input numbers, and then they will apply this ReLU nonlinear uh, feature, all of these 20 nodes. Then I want to construct another layer of 20. So all of these 20 nodes will be connected with weights to the first 20 nodes, again, with an activation of ReLU. Then I, will, uh, I want to um, construct, uh, for example, two as an output, which means that uh, this layer here will be connected to the output two nodes, which will be just an, a linear activation. So we'll take a linear uh, operation of the 20 uh, nodes before. Then I this is compiled. It means that I'm constructing uh, more or less the, the neural network, uh, saying that uh, the loss, so how it, uh, what, what kind of error you want to minimize is MSE. Uh, so the one we want here and the optimizer. So the way it does is a SGD. So a stochastic gradient, gradient descent. Uh, it means just it, how, when you have the gradient, how to apply. And uh, this you can, uh, you don't need to, to know. Uh, so, and it contracts everything by itself. Uh, did I import Keras? Yes. Apologize, I could have left. Can I ask why? Sure. Uh, so we use the neural network to extract the features. Sorry, sorry. We, we use the neural network to extract features. Uh, actually, no. So uh, in this particular sense, we are using again the state as the feature. So you can you can uh, um, think of it as the features of um, the feature are the state, and then from those features, instead of having a pure linear function, you are using the neural network. In principle, you could do. Uh, in principle, you could do uh, feature extraction with, with the neural network, it, it's something else. But in principle, you could have another neural network that takes the state and produce the features. 
but we are dealing with the part from the features onwards. Okay, so we are dealing with the fact that our feature vector now is exactly the same as the um, as the as in the case of the linear approximation. So it's the same thing as here. I, I apologize. We are dealing with polynomial features with um, only first order. So we are at this point here, but instead of using this linear approximation for the value, we are using this nonlinear approximation for the value. Okay. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I constructed the model. Uh, uh, is it fine with uh, this question? So, so the four inputs are the position velocity. Yes, exactly. But, but in a, yes, exactly, yes. But for, for example, they could be state aggregation. So I could do state aggregation of those four so I have a bin vector of all zero and one and give that vector to the neural network. It will probably not work that great, but it, I could do it because the two things are separate. The feature on one part and the fact that you, we want a nonlinear approximation from the features to the uh, value. And, uh, and the feature is from negative to positive values. Yes. But here you use ReLU for the activation. Yes, uh, the ReLU uh, for the activation provides a positive value, but the parameters could be negative. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, H11 will always produce a positive value, but then uh, W to one could be minus one. So this positive value could become a negative value in the second, uh, in the second activation. And the last, uh, the last um, layer is linear. So it does not have this ReLU. So it could be negative or positive or whatever. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. And okay, so, um, I created this simple neural network to, to show that there is this uh, simple uh, uh, summary function. It just, in, it just shows that the fact that we have created a model in a sequential way, we have this description. Um, it said, I have, I'm starting with a dense. Um, I have 100 parameters only to get to the first layer. I have 420 parameters from the first layer to the to a second, I have other uh, other forty two to in final. So, very simple neural network already has five hundred sixty two trainable parameters. Okay. Um, then, okay. This is essentially what I'm going to do. Um, I, I can. I will do something that I will break everything, but I just, I already apologize. I will remove it. No, I, I, I can, okay. Okay, uh, just, just to show, okay, good. So we have, uh, this is the same class as before, is the SARSA, but now we will have a neural network to approximate the value. Exactly the same as before, so we have gamma, we have our input uh, size, we have an action size, we have a learning rate. But now for each action, where usually we had a, a storage of tabular values W, or we had the components, now what we have is for each value we have created one model, which is a neural network. Okay, I created a very simple thing. This is uh, one. The last output is one because this won't be the single value for that action uh, given a state, but the state will be an input. So the input is the state. 
the first there is a 20 layer in the uh, 20 nodes in the first layer 20 nodes in the second and then the last one will be just one value which is the value of that uh, and i will try with optimize with uh, with this uh, method which uh, uses the, the stochastic gradient descent then the single step update is that I get a state, I get an action, I get a reward, I get a new state, I get a new action. Now, uh, I've just modified this to, to, in a sense, answer your question, uh, which now S is the state, X, which I needed to reshape because the neural network, uh, instead of a vector, it only requires a vector of other dimension. So this is, this is a technical issue, but I'm calling it X, okay, because even if it's the state, this we are dealing with as it is the feature vector. Okay, so this is the feature vector of the state S. This is the feature vector of the state S prime, the new state. Then I'm applying the neural network at position given by the action to the to X to the feature vectors. This does what these simple lines here tells, tells us to give X as an input. And it automatically by itself, this method takes it, does all the operation in the first layer, all the operation in the second layer and re re returns only the, the last layer, so the output, okay? So by doing this, I have effectively used the neural network to produce the approximation Nonlinear approximation of the value given the feature vector, and then I do it also for the new, uh, for the queue in the new state and the new action, and then where I used to have the, the delta q, so I was already doing the update in delta. Now I want to give the target. Okay, so the delta was r plus zero, which was the target minus the old value of q okay actually since it's already implicit in the construction of the neural network of keras which we will try to go towards the target instead of the saying that the delta is this i'm saying your target is the first part r plus zero your target is r plus gamma multiplied by the new gamma uh, new q okay and then I take the target, I reshape it because again, uh, this neural network re requires a certain shape of the vector. And then I let me cancel this, which was uh, just it's, cl uh, it's cluttering everything. Okay. This is I taking the neural network corresponding to the state, to the action I, I took. And I'm using this method fit, which just means this is your input X this features. You, you already know what it will end up uh, with, uh, with a neural network because it, you can calculate. This is the target. Try to minimize it, okay? And since I have not put anything, this means that he will take one with only one instance of X. It will try to match it with the target. It will construct automatically the gradient for all of the internal weights, which are 562 or whatever. And then it will follow the gradient one step with the learning rate we gave, okay? Which is not ideal. And uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, I didn't understand why we have a neural network for each action. Good, good, good question. So, um, um, we are dealing with Sarsa and we are still using a tabular, um, tabular method for the actions. So, Sarsa, what, what, uh, what does it want to do, Sarsa? Sarsa wants to have the Q value for each actions and or an approximate value of the Q value for each action, and then choose the Q value, which is best 
uh, or uh, do an extra and greedy policy on that. I could have done that as an input of a, of a, um, of a neural network was also the action, okay? And then I, I could have done that the approximate value of Q given an input X and given an input A is this, given an input X prime and given an, an input A prime is that, compare it. I could have done that, but so far we are, we are, we are using a very a, a step um, below in which for each action separately, like in a discretized manner, I'm using uh, value approximation. So I do not approximate the value given the action because for each action, I am approximate only in the, in the state space. So this is value approximation in state, but not in action. Normally speaking, all of the thing you can find in um, tutorials, everything, will have, um, will have um, a value approximation in both actions. And uh, I mean, value approximation, in, 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 not in this tabular way. But I wanted to present as a first step that you have different value approximation, but the action space is perfectly separated, which is fine in this case because Scarf Pola has only two actions, left and right. So I just need to, to save two things. If the action space uh, were more complicated, then it would not be a good idea. I hope this answered your question, but it yes. was very important. So thank you very much. Okay, so uh, everything else is the same. Excuse me. Yes. I have a, a real question for, for yes. once. Uh, so could you also have done uh, a neural network which has just states as inputs, but as outputs, uh, the vector of values labeled by actions? Uh, Q1 and Q2 as outputs. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I wanted to, in in a, in a way, I wanted to be modular in the sense that since I kept two tabular uh, weights. Uh, here I, and there, I, so. I understand the reason. The, the the question I'm asking is is that, that you expect. I mean, if it works, you expect this neural network to discover these two different neural networks that you have to discover the same description of the states for it to work, right? Yes. So there is a, especially the, the, the first layers, hypothetically should converge to the same weights because they want to describe the state space in the same fashion. And then only deeper layers then would decide whether it's good to take one action or the other. So probably a, a single neural network that which then uh, sort of bifurcates into two would, would have been able okay. to represent uh, as well. I have a couple of answers to that. Uh, first of all, um, we are using sequential. This is in, uh, rather in interesting, actually. Sequential means that uh, there is no bif bifurcation. Uh, it's very simple to construct a, a, something which has two different output and to separate whenever you want the neural network, whatever, wherever to have the two different output. It is true that the lower, uh, that lower levels um, of lower layers should find in a sort a feature extraction in a sense that they should rec recognize what is important of the state and what is not. And so it could be beneficial to have them together. Uh, what it does, which it was not exactly what I was talking uh, before, it of course, it will change. If you have an action, the update will change the value also for the other action. Uh, which is fine. So let's let's say that I have a, right now what I meant with 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 uh, action uh, the fact that we are tabular in action is that what happens in action A is stays in action A. So of course since we have value approximation, what happens with a state could change what I, I'm, for certain ch will change the value for another state, but will not this change of parameters will not uh, change what is the um, approximate value for another action 
if you if you use a single neural network even if it's uh, sharing only a few feature vector uh, feature layers uh, layers uh, below for sure it will be that the two action will be speaking together which then brings the fact that the, it's, it's a value approximation in both a state and action it can be done should be done most probably will perform better but it added this fact that it's not an approximated only in state so i did i wanted to keep it separate okay, okay thank you that's great thanks uh okay um <laughs> this is how it performs <laughs> so um i i did i did uh, only 300 episodes and i will show you why um and it actually performs very poorly um and you can understand why i mean the best model so far had a, a six space right it was beginning one one three two so i had six different distinct space of which he wanted to find the policy and it took several uh, hundred episodes to, to find it this method is clearly much more intelligent but it's much much slower at this uh, this point and um, and has 400 uh, parameter space of very large okay so what is so this is as i said this is the worst implementation of the of the neural network inside the reinforcement learning which you will ever see in your life i hope uh, for several reasons what is normally not done um, as such is this it is true that this method is on uh, it's a, it's a it's a stepwise method you can apply every step but first of all it's extremely um costly to call for the fit function and do it for only one it's a bad idea also since the parameter space uh, it's very large um generally speaking what it's done is that you you collect a batch of many many um single steps so you you will have instead of having one single step update you have first a part in which you uh, um, you collect all the states, all the new states, all the actions. Then at certain point, like, okay, I've collected enough. For all of the, those, you will uh, calculate the targets, and then you will have a much larger um, list of uh, state actions, new state rewards, which leads to target. And then you will give it once, and then you can do it many things so maybe you, you will uh, run through it many times uh, randomizing the order in which you take them essentially or you you will have to do a lot of other technical things so this is the closest implementation with a neural network to what we have seen for example with a linear approximation essentially it's the same thing but instead of a linear approximation we use a neural network so this is why i'm wanting to say i strongly advise to to go to any tutorial with neural networks and reinforcement learning and see what how it should be done on a technical level but on a basic level this is what it does um, right here um, yes so i wanted to add in two minutes to what antonio was saying before that uh, because i i recalled that um so Andre was saying that there the is perhaps two to you 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 need some once the expert advice was everything and so you rely um, relied uh, heavily upon that so the first I will I will perhaps be a bit imprecise but the first uh, programs to play chess uh, automated were actually a lot of features were were constructed by human by expert players and etc cetera, etc cetera. so once it, everything was a priori created the feature was created by experts and it worked and it worked quite well and and the other uh, way to planning and programming worked against play, human players but he had relied heavily on on the on the uh, on human advice then i just saying because i i recall some expert um i forgot one of one of the leading experts in in this technological application of neural network we said 
one of the things which I had to deal which which scared me in a sense, I'm, I'm paraphrasing quite heavily, is that I had to abandon the fact that my intuition as an input to the, to, to the, to the machine learning helped the machine. In the end, given sufficient amount of data, sufficient amount of, of uh, time, the machine without my advice, without my expertise worked better. So I think it's, it's nice because I think there is a scale. If you want to solve a technical, technological level at your level, then in human advice, human intuition or physical intuition, it's definitely important. But I think that at the highest level of uh, AlphaGo and things, with, then I think that there it's already where a high volume enough of data and everything crashed the human expertise. I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, yes, I, I, I wanted to give you a word even without the, the raise the hand, please. Yeah, thank, thank you for, for bringing this up because I think it's very important. So, um, so I, I, I totally understand what, uh, what, what you were, the sentence you were quoting. Uh, the point is that uh, the objective uh, here was performance. So the, the researcher you were, you were talking about was saying, if I remove my input, then my system has a better performance. But we always have to deal with multi-objective optimization. So performance is one axis, but then you have to ask whether it comes at compromising explainability. So your understanding of what the thing is doing, right? And, and then that, here there is where the trade-off is. So if you accept to give up uh, knowing what the system is doing, so if you're interested in having a black box, which is giving you high performance, then of course, uh, your intuition might hinder the problem. And, and we see many examples of this. Uh, we see in applications that uh, if you run a uh, uh, multi-agent reinforcement le learning system, it can discover things that you didn't think about, okay? Uh, so it, there's an enormous power in that, uh, but also uh, there, is a, uh, there are limits to explainability. So, and clearly the other side of the spectrum is where you want to have a system which is as clean as possible, and then you have to put a lot of expert advice. And many times you get a, a negative answer from your system. So performance is poor, which is giving you something understandable is the fact that your attempt sucks, you made some error, but it's an interpretable feedback from the system. So clearly uh, there's a lot of room in the middle, uh, which, which one has to explore, but uh, I think that it's it's a bad idea to to be uh, to make a strongman argument in favor of either full automatic learning or either full uh, modeling without using uh, machine learning as a tool. Is that fair enough? Absolutely. And um, with that, I, if nobody has question, I would also. Continue. I have a question. If I yes, can. please. Uh, maybe more one curiosity. So the amount of hidden layer that you used for your neural network, yeah. did you choose that number with some criterion or is only? Mm... No, I, I I did not use any criterion. Um... But there is some correlation between increasing the number of uh, hidden layer and the increasing of the performance of the. Uh, very roughly speaking, uh, I know that, um, at la I mean, it, it, let's keep the number of parameters fixed. Okay, so let's make strangely different neural network with the same number of parameters. If it's too shallow, if it's one, one layer or, or two layer, one layer, a hidden layer, it's been demonstrated that it's, even if it should work, it does not work. So performance has been shown to get very get better and better when the neural network becomes deep and deep means that he has uh, more than what I use like uh, start to have uh, um, up to tens I don't know 
uh, mm -hmm. different uh, layers, okay? So if, if there is an idea that a neural network works better if it's deeper than it's uh, shallower, because as actually, as uh, Antonio mentioned, it turns out that the, it, you can clearly see that the lowest layers learn basic feature and construct on those basic feature and construct on those basic feature and only the upper layers uh, need to do the task, okay? So it turns out that you, the, the lower part of your neural network is actually feature extracting in a sense, and then the upper part is learning to do what it must do. Uh, but with great power, uh, great responsibility, and it turns out that if you do not do anything, so if you do not do any technical uh, tricks, if you have deep layers, features, uh, weights start to explode or even worse, start to go to never update. Because this is a chain, a chain uh, of gradients. And some of these gradients are zero because of the ReLU function. So at the certain point, you have a, a total percolation of zero updates. So if you do not do anything and you start, okay, I just want something uh, narrow but long, narrow but deep, um, then you start having issue with convergence, with uh, exploding gradients or zero gradients or stuff, and then you have to solve it with technical issues, and etc. So I choose two hidden layers because it's not, it's it's a compromise, and also because the problem is very simple in the sense that we saw that the solution actually. Uh, requires to know to discard the first uh, uh, um, value, discard the second value, know only if the fourth value is uh, positive or negative, and the third value is should be just so that if you have a quadratic formula and you have a cutoff, it's already fine. So I use two hidden layers, which is something actually two or three hidden layers is something which you, you will see most of the time as something which is a neural network and not a, and not a linear operation, but um, so it has some depth, but it has no real problem in working without using any technical tricks. Okay, and another one, if I can, maybe to Professor Celani, because before you mentioned about. Uh, uh, Give me uh, uh, some time just to add something to this first question. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, we can go on to the second one. Uh, so, so, so that you don't believe that uh, we are not losing good habits. So with every question comes an exercise. Uh, and the exercise here is actually quite particularly interesting because suppose you have a neural network with sigmoid functions, okay, not ReLU. It's just something which approximates a step. Now, if, if you combine two sigmoids, you can make up a box. So a simple linear combination of two sigmoids, one that goes like this, and the other one which goes in the other direction, if you combine them, plus and minus, you can make a box. So actually, if you combine linearly these functions, you can construct state aggregation. It requires just a few networks, nodes. Do you see that? I don't have to picture, but think about just two nodes, which one takes the one real input and makes a step function. The other one takes the same input with a different offset and the minus sign, it makes a, a step function in the other direction. And if you combine the two, you can make a box, okay? It's a very simple exercise in uh, combining uh, uh, transfer functions to make a sigmoid. So you actually, with few nodes, you can construct exactly the boxes that uh, uh, I already was talking about in which you were partitioning, making state aggregation. So actually there is a minimal state, uh, minimal neural network, which does exactly the same job as state aggregation and should be able to, to learn an optimal policy with very few nodes. So while I say that uh, the straight, the statement by Monali in general is correct. So deeper network have a larger expressivity. So if you are looking for complex forms of your Q function, you should have deeper networks and wider also, et cetera. But in this particular case, you could make it work with a different choice of transfer functions and specific weights, which we, you can almost compute by hand, given the fact that you know that there is one particular uh, 
state aggregation that works. Uh, was there anything else that I wanted to say? Oh yeah, maybe I don't know if I'm gonna do, do you want to comment later on the uh, on the code that is available in which you take images of the cut pole and then uh, I'm gonna agree with that. Yes, uh, so um, actually it, it's, it's not, uh, so it, it's not taking images. Uh, I will, I will show, I will share. Uh, so this was a previous ex 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 exercise uh, in which you want to use a um, neural network with a deep Q learning. So it, it's slightly different. And it's, it's a, an exercise which actually works better in the sense that it arrives to, to a much better, um, uh, much better um, solution. It's clearly much more complex. This was not done by me. I have to credit the previous um, person who, who did the exercises. And I will share it. And I wanted to also do this is much better uh, it's, it's a step forward in the way in which um, neural network should be used uh, for the first learning i did i choose not to do this and do um, what i present just because then you have the idea of exactly what changed where to arrive to a, a nonlinear uh, function approximation and this is written much more uh, closely to what is done in technological sense. You see, for example, there is, um, there is okay, the, the um, neural network is the same, but then the, the brain, so the algorithm, uh, it's as a, of course, an act, as, as a remember, so he has to, um, the way to store uh, information and trajectories, and then have a train, which is, a rather uh, long term. And so it's written in a different structure. I wanted to present at first, first, at first something which is in, in the same structure as we always saw. Uh, but then here you can, you should be able to, uh, to read it and understand uh, what are the parallels or how to use in a better way. So, yes. So there was a second question then. Yeah, when you mentioned multi-agent, do you mean, what, what exactly do you mean? Do you mean by paralyzing the problem and the, 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 the train or what exactly? Who said multi-agent? Did I say? Uh, yeah, you mentioned before when, um, I don't remember exactly um, after one question, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. My, my, or I don't know, or maybe if I can tell it better. So this type of problem can be parallelized then to combine the result and the... Um, so I must admit, I don't remember when I said multi-agent today. Uh, so I... Uh, I'm not sure I can be very helpful. So there are things that you can do. Uh, if, I mean, I'm just picking up the, the, the buzzwords that you say. So parallelizing, yes, you could be doing several trainings together and then collect all the information into a single Q function, be tabular or represented in different ways. This is something we, you can do and speeds up learning for sure. It is also a way to do exploration uh, by combining different and uh, by sort of doing ensemble exploration rather than uh, uh, you making exploration in time. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm picking up the, the right question here. What I can say is that next week we will be doing multi agent reinforcement learning. So we will take a view on this from okay, okay, okay. all the multi agents. Just one thing. I, I, I... Uh, before I wanted to, I was talking um, and it made no sense because I, I thought I was sharing and I wanted to, to show that. Uh, so there is another exercise which I will share with today's uh, notebook, uh, which you can use and look up if you want to see a better version of reinforcement learning with neural network. 
apologize. I, I thought I was sharing. Okay, so we are running uh, late again, so I will stop uh, recording.